Thank you. We think about our bodies as being things that we move and things that we do things with. But what I want to say in this little talk is that our bodies are also sensory organs and multi-sensory organs and the seat of all our conscious experience. And there's been a long tradition of asking, what are the most important, what are the fundamental sensations that we get from our body? And we get an experience of our body in space from this beautiful biotechnology, this beautiful biological mechanism, the vestibular system. So I want to tell you a little bit about your vestibular system. In both of your ears, as well as the auditory part of the ear, you've got a vestibular part of the ear. And the vestibular system tells you about the position and movement of your head in space. So it's really important if you want to stay standing up, for example. The vestibular system comprises or includes three semicircular canals. And they are filled with fluid so that when you move your head, the fluid in the canals remains static because of its pressure. And that pulls on some little hair cells in the walls of the canal, which can then send signals to the brain to tell you how your head is moving. So you have this beautiful apparatus which gives you these fundamental signals to tell you when you're the right way up, when you're the wrong way up, when you're falling to one side or falling to the other. So the vestibular system is essential for giving us our orientation and our sense of being appropriately related to the world. Now, one of the interesting things about the sensory systems of the body is as well as providing a primary function, like telling us when we're falling to one side or the other, they also seem to be used to provide a higher level of our experience, which is sometimes called the bodily self. So just to give an example of this, these vestibular canals uh, in, either, in, in both ears project to a number of different brain areas, including the temporoparietal junction, which you can see in the, uh, white, with the white arrow in the, the picture in front of you. Now, there are very few cases where clinical medicine allows us to stimulate the brain directly. And one of them is operations on patients who have intractable drug-resistant epilepsy and in whom it's appropriate to explore the different brain areas by stimulating them through electrodes placed directly on the cortical surface. Now, this kind of data is absolute gold dust scientifically because it allows the neurosurgeon, on the basis of clinical need, to stimulate a given brain area directly and see what the patient feels, because the patient is completely awake throughout the entire procedure. And when this region of the brain, the temporoparietal junction, to which these semicircular canal vestibular signals project, when it is stimulated directly by the neurosurgeon, patients will occasionally report strange bodily experiences. And in particular, they'll report the out-of-body experience, the feeling that the self and the body are becoming decoupled. And here's just an artist's representation of this uh, feeling that the patient may report under this kind of stimulation, that they're no longer linked to their body. So as well as the vestibular canals providing this fundamental information on how my head is placed and how it's moving and how it's rotating, they also seem to provide a basic way of keeping me in this physical body. Another principle that I want to give you about the sensory equipment of the body is that our experience of our body is fundamentally multisensory and is based on correlations between different sensory signals. And I'm part of a European project called VERE, which includes a number of different experiments which have been looking at the importance of correlation in bringing all of these sensory signals together to give us a sense of our own body. And one of the experiments that's been done within VERE is, I hope, on the next slide, a full body illusion. It's a really rather in interesting combination of technology and basic neuro, uh, neuropsychological experience. 
In the full body illusion, the participant wears a head-mounted display, which contains a video feed from a camera positioned behind them. So the participant in this experiment has the utterly bizarre experience of looking at their own back. Right? This is something which you don't normally get. And while the participant is looking at their own back via the head-mounted display, they are stroked on their back by a long wooden stick, which you can see. You can't see the person holding the stick, but they're stroked on their back by a long wooden stick. So the critical point here is that when the participant looks in the head-mounted display, they see somebody in front of them who is being stroked on the back, which is coming from the video feed, and they feel themselves being stroked on the back. And these two things happen in perfect synchrony. So there's a beautiful correlation between what you see and what you feel. And your brain then has to try and put these two things together. And the way that it does that is by saying, well, that guy that you can see in front of you, that's you. So there's the brain's solution to the multisensory inputs that it gets and to the brain's solution to produce a pattern of inference out of the correlated signals is to assume that it's looking at its own, that you're looking at your own back and that you're looking at yourself from the outside. So there's an illusion of self-location. Now, one thing that we've learned in this project is you need to ask the right questions to get at these strange bodily experiences. If you ask people directly, you know, how do you feel and what's your experience of your own body, people just tend to say, uh, mm, don't know. So you have to ask the correct question. So in this kind of situation, we might ask a question like, how far do you think it is from where you are to the front wall of the room that you can see in front of you? And that's a good implicit measure of this illusion, because if the illusion is working and you really think that you are the person whose back you can be seen being stroked in front of you, then you'll think you're closer to the front wall of the room than you really are. So what you see and what you feel in this case are giving you this sense of self and your sense of where that self is with respect to the environment. So that deals with correlation. The next thing I want to tell you is about all the sensory signals which are really in the bodily tissue itself. Okay? So we think about our muscles as being motors, and it comes, as a bit of, it comes as a bit of a surprise to many people to realize that the muscles are also exquisitely sensitive. So in the, uh, in the picture here, you see the main muscle fibers which contract when we move. But you can see, arrowed in white, a little extra kind of fiber which runs in parallel, which is a sensory fiber. It's called the muscle spindle. And the muscle spindle is connected to a neuron, and it sends a signal to your brain whenever your muscle is stretched. Okay? So whenever your muscle is stretched, your brain knows about it. And just paradoxically, the motor action of muscles is to contract. A muscle can't stretch by itself. It has to be stretched by its antagonist opposite pair. But the sensory performance of the muscle is to detect when it's being stretched. So that, for example, in this case here, where somebody is flexing their biceps, they're going to be stretching their triceps. And they're going to be sending sensory signals from the spindles in their triceps that the triceps is getting longer. And that means the fingers, are, the hand is coming closer to the face. Now, this is a, another way that people like me think, let's have fun with this system. Let's try to muck it up. Let's try to understand the bodily experiences that people have by interfering with them. And one of the ways that we can do that is by vibrating the tendons at the end of the muscle by applying a standard massage vibrator, which will cause the sensory endings, the muscle spindles, to get very rapidly stretched. And that causes signals to be sent from the spindles to the brain, indicating that the muscle is stretching, even when it isn't. So you can have a person who is completely still, and if you vibrate the biceps, then the signals uh, from the biceps, muscle spindles, will be sent to the brain, indicating that the biceps is getting longer, and people will feel that their hand is moving in that direction, and if you vibrate the triceps tendon, that their hand is moving in that direction. So you can effectively move people's awareness of their bodies around in space simply by mechanically vibrating their tendons. And a beautiful demonstration of the power of these internal sensory signals within our bodies to give us our sense of self comes from some experiments that were done by Lackner a few years ago. 
What Lackner asked people to do was to hold their nose with their right thumb and index finger. And while he was doing that, he vibrated the biceps tendon with a massage vibrator. And this stretched the muscle spindles in the biceps. And they sent a signal to the brain saying, your biceps is getting longer. Now, if your biceps is getting longer, it means that your hand is moving away from your face. But if you have a tactile signal from your skin that you're holding onto your own nose, how is your brain going to make sense of that? And it turns out that people have the very strong experience that their nose is getting longer and longer and longer. And that's the brain's way of reconciling the signal that's sent from the muscles to the brain with the signals that are sent from the skin to the brain to tell you that you're holding your own nose. Something's got to give. What gives? Well, the brain reconstructs a body image of how long your nose is. And Lackner then did the obvious other experiment, which is to now vibrate the triceps tendon, and that stretches the muscle spindles in the triceps muscle to indicate to the triceps muscle that it's lengthening, which is what you would normally get if your hand was moving towards your face. And if you do that while you hold your nose, you feel your nose is being squashed into your face and actually put through the center of your head. So the brain is constructing a body image on the fly. And I'd just like to end with an example of uh, a, an experiment of our own where we've looked at this as just as a way of testing how we make up a coherent sense of self. Because the sensory organs in our body are multiple. We have them in our muscles, we have them in our skin, in our joints, all over. But we don't experience several different Patricks. There isn't a muscular Patrick, a skin Patrick, and a joint Patrick. It's all just me. So the brain is able to perform a central integration to tie them all together. And here's just one example following on from the work of Lackner, which we uh, use to investigate this. So we're going to get people now to hold their left index finger with their right hand. And in the red condition, we're going to vibrate the biceps tendon, which is going to give them the illusion that the hand is moving away from the body. And in a control condition shown in blue, we apply the same vibration off the tendon so it doesn't have any effect, but it has the same kind of buzzy noise. So in the red condition, you have the feeling that your index finger is getting longer and longer and longer. And in the blue condition, you have the feeling that your left index finger is absolutely fine. Now, while this is happening, we're going to touch people with two objects on their left index finger. And this is all going to happen very, very rapidly because the vibration lasts about 120 seconds. And during those 120 seconds of vibration and illusory finger lengthening, we're going to touch people on the index finger, and we're going to ask them to compare the distance between the touches on the index finger and two touches which we're simultaneously going to apply to their blindfolded, blindfolded forehead. So the question is, which distance is bigger, the distance we're touching you with on your index finger or the distance that we're touching you with on your forehead? And within 120 seconds, people are able to completely recalibrate their sense of the size of the object that's touching their skin. Because when we ask them, is the tactile distance on the finger bigger or smaller than the tactile distance on the forehead, in the red condition, where they have this feeling of finger lengthening, they'll tend to reply that the tactile distance they're experiencing on the finger is bigger than the one on the forehead, Whereas in the control condition, they say they're the same. So what this means is that signals from the muscles on the right arm are able to change the image you have of your left hand. And your brain uses that immediately to interpret the size of an object touched on the skin of the left finger. And it's all done within seconds. So this is just a demonstration that one of the great tricks of the brain is to take these multiple sensory signals and make them all coherent. And we're just beginning in this particular project to try to understand how that works. Now, if you can understand how our sensory systems work and how we develop a sense of self and a sense of being in our own body from all these different component inputs, this could be technologically useful. So the technological out outlook for the technology participants in our project is to think about what are the alternative inputs that we can use? For example, people who have sensory disabilities, they lack particular sensory signals, blind, uh, blindness, deafness. What are the other inputs that the body allows us to give experience for those people? 
What are the therapies that we can use at the central stage, which try to bring all of these sensory signals together to produce a coherent sense of self? So a disorganized sense of self is a common result of some neurological and neuropsychiatric disabilities. If we can understand how the normal sense of self is constructed, then maybe we can devise multisensory therapies for those conditions. And then finally, it seems to me that there's a very strong link between the ability to bring all these sensory signals together and self-awareness, being who I am and being who you are. And if we can understand that process, then we could, if we wanted to, and if we thought it was ethical, try to begin to develop robots which had a little bit more of that self-awareness that we think we have ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention.